I'm Donna Lance, the Academic Dean here at Moore College of Art and Design, and uh, I want to welcome you to this evening's event and thank you for joining us uh, for tonight's studio conversation, Collectivity in the City, presented in collaboration uh, between the Graduate Studies at Moore program and the City of Philadelphia Mural Arts program. Welcome also this evening to our moderator and members of Amber Art and Design and Works Progress Studio. Before I introduce Jane Golden and tonight's moderate, moderator, Ariella Cohen, I wanted to share with you some of the other upcoming spring and summer graduate program events. On Saturday, March 21, from 9.30 until 12.30 uh, p.m., Graduate Studies at Moore is also presenting an art and special education symposium, Adapting Art for Students with Disabilities. There's still room, there's over 45 people coming. Um, so if you're interested in that topic, please join us. Um, it's free. On July 31st and August 1st, please mark your calendar for our first summer symposium on the theme of time as a medium for socially engaged art. This symposium is presented in collaboration with Mural Arts and we're very excited. Uh, on Friday, August 14th from 6 to 8 p.m., please join us for the <laughs> reception for the graduate thesis exhibition. You can find more information about these events and other events at Moore on our website. And also you'll find information about the symposium on Mural Arts' website. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce and thank a few people. Um, Daniel Tucker, please stand. He's our graduate program manager in social and studio practice. Uh, Daniel did a yeoman's job in organizing tonight's event. Michelle Garrigan Durant, Associate Dean of Graduate Studies. And do we have any more uh, graduate faculty here? Any more graduate students? All right, welcome. Glad to see you. Um, and with us this evening for Mural Arts is Todd Bressy, the Interim Coordinator of Mural Lab, who also helped uh, plan this event. Todd invited Works Progress to join us for this evening's panel. Todd is also the Interim Coordinator of Artistic Planning for Mural Arts, which means he helps plan long-range program and project development uh, and has played an early role in conceptualizing and launching major projects like Neighborhood Time Exchange, Philly Painting, Open Source, and uh, visiting curator and artist residencies. Thank you especially to Todd and Daniel. Uh, I also think there's probably some other mural arts staff here besides Jane Golden. So if you're here, will you raise your hand so we can acknowledge you? Uh, I also want to acknowledge Chuck Duquesne, our fantastic AV technician, right back there. Um, without whom, none of this would be happening. And to, uh, Morris Communication and Marketing staff, Dave Rizzio, who's also back here. Uh, Jennifer Vatsa, who takes photographs, and Roy Wilbur, our director. Thank you very much. The communication and marketing staff have really provided immeasurable support in getting the word out about this event. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Jane Golden, founder and executive director um, of Mural Arts. Jane has been the driving force behind this program since 1984. Under, G sorry, I just can't say Golden again and again. Under Jane's leadership, um, uh, Mural Arts has created over 3,700 landmark works of public art through innovative collaborations with communities, grassroots organizations, city agencies, schools, philanthropies. In addition to developing innovative programs, Golden has overseen a series of increasingly complex, ambitious, and award-winning public art projects. Golden has received numerous awards for expertise and accomplishments, including Moore College of Art Visionary Woman Award, 
Golden holds a MFA from the Mason Gross School of the Art at Rutgers University and a, a Bachelor's in Fine Arts and Political Science from Stanford University. In addition, she has received honorary um, PhDs from Swarthmore College, Philadelphia Uni Philadelphia's University of the Arts, Widener University, Haverford College, and Villanova University. We're very excited that uh, Jane will start teaching in Moore's MFA Community Practice Program starting this summer. Uh, Jane, would you please uh, come and say a few words? That was so nice, Donna. Thank you so much. So I, I want to start out by thanking Moore College of Art because you guys are very visionary. And when Cecilia Fitzgibbon became the president, because we're friends, she called me up and she said, how can we work together? And I was like, it had just been um, a dream of ours to connect in a more official way with a university or an art school in Philadelphia. And so uh, we decided that Mural Arts would become like the laboratory for some new graduate programs. And so we're really thrilled and honored. It's been great getting to know Daniel um, to start this summer. And so we're very excited about that. So I thank you more for really being open to innovative ways of working. I think that can be really life changing. Um, and I teach at Penn. That's my second job. And I'm there, then I'm not there. And it's very, very random. But this is really substantive. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and then uh, tonight's event is part of something we call Mural Lab. And uh, so what's Mural Lab? Mural Lab is essentially like a think tank at Mural Arts. I would say that one of the things I'm really proud of is that over the last five, six, seven years, we've become sort of um, uh, a group of people who are very curious about best practices, what's going on as it relates to art and social practice across the country, around the world. We are bringing in artists. We're looking at what people are thinking about, talking about. And Todd Bressy and I, we crossed paths many, many years ago. And he has been just an incredible um, thought partner and real leader of artistic and innovative practices at Mural Arts. I think you know we need to surround ourselves with people who are not just going to compliment you, but people who are going to challenge you. And so the last number of years have been really, I'd say, life-changing for the Mural Arts program. Program. And Todd, I just, I am so grateful to you for doing that. And so together, we created Mural Lab, where several times a year we bring in great speakers and we hear and listen to what's going on different places and we learn from them. And it's um, really been wonderful. And so tonight, I think I am like extra proud of the group who's here tonight because uh, Works Progress, I've just admired your work read about you, and, and just am thrilled to meet you and so glad that you're going to spend tomorrow going around and looking at our different projects. And then, of course, there's Amber. And, like, you know, I go way back with um, both Ernell and Kier. And there's um, a word at Mural Arts that I really like. Uh, Thora Jacobson used to use it all the time, and that word is generative. And I think that everything we do should be generative. And I think that goes for our work in communities and neighborhoods, with artists, with young people, with people in our prison program, our behavioral health program. What we want to do is touch people and impact them and inspire them so that other things can happen. And that might be connected to mural arts and it may not be connected to mural arts. So to see these artists really take off and make their mark in this world in a profound way is something that makes me so incredibly proud. I am so proud of what they are doing. And I think it's emblematic of our philosophy that we want to support artists as much as possible because we believe at the end of the day that artists are really the backbone of our society. They are our creative and our innovative thinkers. And what would our world be like without art? So I commend you, I applaud you, and just know how proud we are of your work. And Jenny, of course. I just, I go, Jenny, of course, I'm very proud of you too, but I just go so far back with these two. It's like they're part of our family. It's like my relatives. <laughs> so anyway, it's great. Um, and then lastly, I just want to talk for a minute about our evolving practice at Mural Arts, because that's connected to what you're going to hear from Amber and Works Progress and what Mural Lab is about. Like, I think, like, if you're standing still, you're going backwards. So we have realized that, you know, why are we defining, a, you know, a, a mural one way? And what's muralism in the 21st century? And what's the future of this genre? We feel really proud to be part of this tradition that, you know, that, that had the Mexican muralists and political art 
this country in the 60s and 70s and going further back, the WPA, that's all wonderful. But what is muralism today? And with all this talk around the country and the world about social practice, how does this relate to what we're doing? And so about six years ago, we worked with an artist named Stephen Powers. He did a series that you might know called Love Letters, 60 second story rooftops you can see from the L, all about love, and it was text. And people said in West Philly, like, that's not a mural arts mural. What is that? We went, yes, you have to understand, there is no one way of working. This is art, and it's open to all kinds of expressions. So Steve opened the door for us to think differently. And then we worked with Mijin Yoon and did Light Drift, the orbs along the Schuylkill. And then Philly painting with Haas and Haas. And then last year, Katerina Grossa to do color along seven miles of the Amtrak corridor. And now, in this fall, we're, cre we're doing something called Open Source, which is this major public art exhibition where we're working with 14 extraordinary artists from all over who are going to work in public spaces around Philadelphia. So I think this is important because what we've learned over the years is we've learned where we dig in and we hold our ground and we say what we believe in and then where we course correct. And we have to remain open to evolving all the time. That is a hallmark of a program that is successful, that you know when and where and how to change. And we have been so deeply influenced and inspired by artists from Philadelphia and from around the world. They feed us, they nurture us, they inspire us. And at the end of the day, they remind me continually that art can ignite change and transformation. And so what you're hearing here tonight is really an extension of this wonderful, inspiring direction at the Mural Arts Program. And I thank so many of you who are in this audience tonight for driving our vision forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. You always inspire me. Uh, our moderator this evening is Ariella, Ariella Cohen, and who is the executive editor of Next City, a nonprofit news website uh, covering cities. Uh, Ariella is an award-winning journalist with 11 years of experience reporting on urban change, politics, and policy. Prior to joining Next City, she co-founded New Orleans' first online investigative news outlet, The Lens, and worked as a staff reporter for the Brooklyn paper in New York. She has reported on community-engaged design and public art in New Orleans, New York, and around the country. You can follow her on Ariella Cohen on Twitter. And she will be introducing our uh, uh, guests this evening and also introducing and uh, moderating this evening's discussion. Thank you. Welcome. Well, thank you for that introduction and thank you to Moore and Mural Arts for bringing me here tonight. I'm so excited to see so many people out here tonight. Um, so I'm honored to be here with five inspiring artists. Um, and before we get into their fantastic work, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Next City. So you can find us online at nextcity.org. We're Philadelphia-based, but we cover urban change and politics policy um, around, the, around the world, actually. And so art is one piece of what we do, but we also cover uh, economic development, um, health and sustainability, and lots of environmental issues. So I definitely welcome you to check that out. So now we'll move on to introduce our guests. So Amber Arts is comprised of five international artists with years of specialized experience. Arnell Martinez, Kier Johnson, Charles Barbin, Willis, Nomo Humphreys, and Lena, Linda Fernandez. Um, Linda, Kier, and Arnell will be with, here, with us here tonight. Um, Amber Art is committed to creating meaningful public art that is transcendent and continually challenges the norm with innovative design and cutting edge fabrication. The Amber team has been working in the public sphere for the past 10 years, primarily within marginalized communities with little or no access to art. They came together as a collective in 2011 with a common goal to create meaningful public art that is transcendent and a platform for social practice within communities. Um, Works Progress Studio is an artist-based LLC in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Led by husband and wife team, collaborative directors Colin Clocker and Shania Mattinson, 
Works Progress engages an extensive network of artists, designers, organizers, researchers, and other creative people to realize imaginative public art and design projects rooted in place and purpose. We have a lot to talk about over the next few hours, so I'll give you the order of events and then let Amber Arts and Works Progress show you their work. Um, so first, we're going to have uh, Amber and Works Progress show a brief presentation where the, you will get to see some of the art that we'll be discussing tonight. And then following the presentations, we'll have a 45-minute conversation. That'll be me moderating and these folks talking. And then once you've all heard enough to have questions of your own, we'll open it up to questions from the audience for the final 30 minutes. So thank you again, and I'm looking forward to getting started. Hi, everyone. Let's see if we can get this to. Okay. I see Chuck working on it. There it is. Cool. So, first of all, thank you to everyone at Mural Arts, Moore College of Art and Design, and Next City for bringing us here. We're extremely excited to be here in Philadelphia. This is our first time here. Um, I thought we, I would start by just giving you a little bit of a background on what Works Progress is and what our model is, because I realize that it is um, a hybrid and, and maybe different from a lot of collectives or other sorts of organizations. So we are a public art and design studio focused on collaborative participatory projects. Um, we've been doing this work together as Works Progress since about 2010. Um, we work with a variety of other artists, designers, organizations, and groups. Um, Colin and I are the co-founders of Works Progress and collaborative directors and also lead artists and designers of all the projects that we do. Um, we're also married and have a two-year-old son, so this is also kind of a family art and design business. Um, we live and work out of an apartment in northeast Minneapolis, but our projects happen across the Twin Cities and also sometimes in other cities. Um, we both have non-traditional art and design backgrounds. There are no slides to go with what I'm saying right now, so you're not missing anything. Don't worry. Um, he'll get it figured out. Um, we didn't go to school for art. Um, Colin studied architecture. I studied comparative literature and history of science. Um, and neither of us has an advanced degree. Um, we began doing this work as organizers, organizing independent arts and culture programs, um, and also um, including an art and community space called the West Bank Social Center. And so once we get some images going, okay, here we go. Um, these will just be playing in the background. Um, and we just wanted to tell you a little bit more about some of the ways that we think about the work that we're doing. Um, and so these are all images from projects um, spanning the last five years or so. Um, so a little bit more about how we work. Um, all of our projects are collaborative by design. Um, Chennai and I are the co-directors of Works Progress, but none of what we do would be possible without um, a really large network of people um, from all over the Twin Cities and kind of metro region. Um, our creative process is participatory and responsive, um, which to us means that we involve our collaborators very early in a project and often try to find ways for that project to live on without our direct involvement um, if it's successful. Um, and that way, the collective that is part of our collective actually expands and contracts um, depending on the specific project and the time in that project. The resulting products of that collaborative work take many different forms, from publications to interactive installations to videos to one-time events. Sometimes a single project involves lots of different interlocking pieces, and we don't always know what we're going to make when we begin. Um, and likewise, we don't ever really know when something is finished. Um, we tend to take a systems thinking approach to social change, um, looking at whole systems and asking where we might most effectively work within that system. What are possible leverage points for change? Um, we're less interested in working within a specific paradigm, so for example, art or community development or design, and more interested in the edges and intersections and blurring and shifting those paradigms um, through projects that bring those different um, worlds together, I guess. Most of our projects have an element of open space in them, space for conversation, deliberation, question asking, um, <clears throat> and exchange. Uh, when those spaces work, the projects themselves evolve and change with time, often in ways that we can't predict or control. Um, well, we don't think of ourselves as necessarily place-based or place-making artists. We hope that all of our projects are rooted in place and have a collective purpose. 
And to us, place is more than the sum of the institutions and infrastructures that make up a city. Um, to us, place is really about the relationships in that place. Um, and one of those relationships that we're most interested in is the relationship between people and their environment, or ecologies of place. Um, and I said that idea of being rooted in both place and purpose. Um, for us, purpose is really about what we think of as our role um, as our descent designers working collaboratively. Um, one of those roles that we really take um, to heart is the role of asking questions differently um, than folks in other professions might. So when working with designers or planners or environmental advocates, as artists, and des as artists we will often bring questions that they didn't think to ask or ask them in a different way, opening up new possibilities um, for what we might do with the answers to those questions. Um, we also see one of our roles as kind of constituting and reconstituting community through that creative process. So we don't necessarily see <clears throat> ourselves as problem solvers, although we do have to do a lot of problem solving work to make these projects happen. We really see ourselves as, um, through that creative process, helping people to recognize the communities that they're part of, whether that be communities of, around an issue, a purpose, geographic, um, or otherwise. So just a little bit more about our studio and how it operates. Um, we are a business, we're not a nonprofit. Um, people in the Twin Cities like to say that Minnesota and the Twin Cities are the land of 10,000 nonprofits. Um, and so a lot of artists go on to either work at, in the nonprofit world or start their own nonprofits to help support their practice. Um, we, a couple of years ago, knew that we needed to make a decision and we were kind of on the fence as a fiscally sponsored um, organization. And through um, a lot of thinking about how did we want to work and what was really important to us, we decided that what was important was working in collaboration, working with um, many of the different nonprofits that already exist. And for us to be the best partners that we could be, we didn't want to become a nonprofit and then have to start competing for those same funds that the people that we wanted to work with um, are already working for. Um, so we decided to form as an LLC. Um, for profit is maybe not quite accurate. Um, we're a low profit <laughs> business. Sometimes no profit. Sometimes no profit. Um, and, uh, and then, so we, out, we have, I think, a pretty diverse way of kind of supporting the studio um, through commissions, individual artist grants that Shania and I apply for, uh, through fellowships. We also do consulting. Um, a lot of different ways that we've figured out to work and to do this work. Um, and to some extent, these are survival strategies for us to continue on. Um, but for us, the practice um, is the same, uh, whether we're working on commission, um, or we're developing a new project with a partner that we, um, that we just met. Um, <clears throat> so whether we begin by identifying a shared need or a challenge with that collaborator, um, a friend of ours describes the, the difference between art and design as design is a, respond, uh, a response to a need, and art is a need to respond. Um, and I really like that way of thinking about it. I think he probably read that somewhere else as well. Um, <laughs> But we really see ourselves in both roles at different times and sometimes at the same time. Um, and to some extent, how we locate our work on that spectrum is not so important as long as the process is clear to everyone that's involved in a project. Um, and although we're gonna, I know we're going to talk more about this in the discussion, um, we just thought we would mention that the context for our work, so the Twin Cities where we live and work primarily, um, is so important to the way that we work and to the way that um, works progress has evolved over time. Um, and one of those things is that the, just the fact that we can do this work full time and that that's the primary way that we support our family and our practice um, is really a testament to how much our community values the contributions of artists and designers. And there really is a lot of opportunity for artists working in these new and social and community arts ways in the Twin Cities and has been for quite a while. Um, and we know that we really have benefited from that um, history and from the mentors and, and the folks that have helped us to evolve. Um, that said, we also know that the Twin Cities has many challenges. I don't know if any of you read an article that was in um, The Atlantic recently that talked about the Minneapolis miracle. Did anybody see that? In Minneapolis, it made the rounds because we love to read about ourselves, I guess. Um, but the, the article was really talking about how the Twin Cities, through um, a combination of policies and um, around um, attracting businesses and white collar workers, has really um, managed to be a place that is relatively affordable, um, but also has a lot of these great amenities around art and culture um, and quality of life. What the article didn't mention um, was that the Twin Cities also has a really stark and persistent inequity. 
um, that falls primarily across racial lines and has a real history, like a lot of cities, of having been planned and developed that way. It's not just an accident that we um, happen to be that way. It's, it's through policies that, that were not mentioned in this article. And as artists and designers, this is something that we think a lot about. And as activists and voters and neighbors, um, are we doing enough to address these really structural and systemic problems? At the same time, is that question enough to say, are we doing enough to fix this? Or do we really need to also be asking how we as individuals benefit from that? As white artists, how have we benefited from those disparities? And then furthermore, through the projects that we do, when we're working with community developers and planners, who is benefiting from those projects? We need to look ahead and, and really think about, over time, how our projects live in the world and to ask if this is how we want to work. Um, we know that artists and designers can and are often instrumentalized in different ways by development projects, and so we just need to be really conscious about how we work and, and ask those really difficult questions. Um, and so one of the things we're really excited about, and this is just how we'll wrap up, I guess, is to have some of those difficult conversations tonight with you all and to learn from um, the work that's happening here, which is so great. So I think we'll just leave it there. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. you. Hi everyone, thank you again for being here and thanks again to Moore, Mural Arts, and to Next City. Um, our presentation is not timed, so Chuck, please bear with us. Oh, there is? Okay, great. I don't know how to use it, but. Um, so we're Amber Art and Design. We are a team of five artists. We joined together in 2011 and we came together to form an LLC we decided that we did not want to take a nonprofit approach at this point. So um, what we do is we work together in collaboration with each other. We also work with other artists and we work on public projects. Um, that takes the shape and form of many different things. So it has been mural projects or community-based projects. We've also done food-based projects, which we'll show you in a little bit. But some of the things that brought us together were our shared values. Um, we appreciate culture and diversity. <coughs> Trust is a big thing that has brought us together. And also, we have a very organic approach towards how we all work together and how we function as a group. Um, we, we have a st structure that's also a very loose-fitting structure. But it is based in a peaceful environment. We don't bring drama into our work. And um, I will let Kier take the stage with the next slide. From the very beginning, it was, it was very important for us to form a entity that, that we could speak for ourselves and uh, stand behind. It, in a way, basically branding us as a, as a creative productive group. And you know, we one of, one of our longest best friends in being mural arts, and one of our hugest collaborators and, and, and continued collaborators and, and supporters both ways, really gave us the platform and the venue to not only get introduced to ourselves, but also really develop and nurture our approach to community engagement, and really develop the techniques and the diversity of how you can go about different ways of, of really infusing art within the community. And because we came from a lot of communities of, of color, we have a very diverse group. You know, we, we were able to go back and work pretty freely within those communities that don't have access to art. You know, and so that is a, a very big component to us is, is, is spreading the power and message that, that, that art can bring as a means of conversation and it's a means of uh, approaching subjects that are usually a little bit more challenging to uh, just have by conversation. One of the bigger other catalysts, so we, we all started in, I guess, mural, muralism and, and mural production and development as, as a means of engaging the community and as a, as a means of uh, capturing the narratives of community. And so we really started in a, 
a 2D capacity. And, you know, our creation of a, of a collective in a, collabor in, in a, in a collaborative of, uh, approach to creative capacities and projects was one that was kind of a response to the contemporary drumline of, of how the, the art world is now. We needed uh, not only to have a, a support of each other, but it also became a, an extreme way of making any project that, that we initiated that much better. We're able to combine and really get uh, a number of heads on any thought process and creative process, which makes any idea that much more layered and that much more successful. So it's not just us as a, a sole entity approaching things, but we're able to approach the theme and production and any aspect of a creative process in a group dynamic, which, which makes the, the process and, and the outcome that much more powerful. The Roots project was a very big catalyst to our development as well, because we realized that we wanted to approach this project and you know, really honor the roots the same way they went about creating their music, which is almost in a musical capacity as a band. So we, that, that kind of led to some of the founding components of us because we were able to really look at you know, how a band functions and knowing that there's, there's many different, different sounds and different strengths that come to creating, creating a song. And so you know, we were really inspired and, and really looked at the roots analytically in, in, in how we uh, created our, our group. And this led to, uh, you know, another big important part of our creative process was the having access to a very large space. You know, so we all share, we don't compartmentalize our space. We, we, we treat it as a, a sectionize it as, as, as a point of medium. So we have a, a wood shop uh, a place to, to work out, a, a place to socialize, but also a place to uh, paint and produce and, and make uh, sculpture. We're very versed in our, our medium production, and at this point, given our collective influence on each other and the means that we bring research to the table, we really have no limitation in terms of the mediums that we approach. We are, we, we're doing things in sculpture now. We're doing things in performance and photography-based mediums. We're doing more event-based projects, and we're still very much entrenched in murals and uh, have a, a number of really exciting projects that we're going to take part in this year. Uh, yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for showing up tonight. And of course, I'd like to thank Jane for <clears throat> her kind words that, that really touched me and meant a lot to me. I'm sure it meant a lot to my cohorts right here as well. Um, yeah, as I said, over the last three years, you know, we've grown quite a bit as a collective. You know, in, individually, we're all uh, involved in some capacity with working with different communities across the city of Philadelphia and abroad. And, you know, working with Mural Arts sort of helped lay down all the groundwork we needed to to develop as a collective, as develop as a sort of a, a communal uh, art making entity in Philadelphia, and over the years, you know, we found lots of inspiration from different places. You know, from for, for, for me personally, being on the sort of the farther side of the 30s, uh, we're all sort of post civil rights uh, movement babies, and and so uh, as a young person, you know, you heard a lot of hip hop music, and that time was really about sort of consciousness, social consciousness, and activism, and so forth. And that really played a role in, in, in my personal development as an artist. You know, you, you, you had all this energy as a young person, but you didn't know how to sort of let it out, right? And so initially it was me spray painting on walls or doing art in classrooms and so forth, but I didn't have a, a proper outlet. So, you know, as, as relatively young people, and I say relatively, uh, we, we had all this sort of creative energy that we wanted to sort of express ourselves with, with mural arts, of course, but also in different capacities, right? So. Uh, for the last three years, we've, we've tried to explore and push the boundaries in terms of social practice and engaging communities in different capacities. We've tried to make the work to be as communal as, pro as possible. Uh, we've used art as a platform for conversation and dialogue and exchange. And what you're looking at here is actually uh, one of our early projects that we did with Made in America, which was sponsored by Budweiser, of course, as you can see, but also featured Jay-Z. Uh, we had two stages set up. One was for us and one was for another local uh, Philadelphia artist. And uh, this was a, let me go back one. Uh, how do you get back on this here? Uh, there you go. So this was, this was a two-day activity where we encouraged all the concert goers 
we had, this was right there on the, um, the mall, right in front of the museum. And we had about 40,000 to 75,000 people show up. Uh, but we had this art painting process, which is a typical mural day uh, sort of painting, paint day process. And we had, I don't know, at least several hundred people come by and paint. And it was, it was a wonderful opportunity for so the, the music goers or the concert goers to be involved in making public art. This is a uh, commission that we got, uh, I think that's the same year, I believe. Uh, one was for a, a young business owner who opened a shop up, in, uh, up on Girard and 19th, I believe. A young man who just recently graduated from school. He had bought a shop and he commissioned us to do a, a work of art. At the bottom there is a piece that was commissioned by the North Shore Beach Club, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and this project, which was I think really sort of galvanizing us as a, as a, as a collective prior to the roots. Uh, and because it was a more layered process, it wasn't quite as uh, sort of commercially driven or it didn't have the notoriety behind it initially. Um, this is actually our second year of Porchlight. Uh, Porchlight was a, a multi-year, multi-site, multi-artist um, exploration of public art and its impact on the communities. Uh, it was uh, a collaboration with Yale University, I believe, and there was a, a, a paper written, a, a research paper that's actually supposed to be published, or has it been published, Jane, yet? Or is it about to be published? Yes, in April, the data will be available. Right, so it's going to soon be published, on, and, and it's really a really deep uh, and, and theoretical approach to the exploration of public art and its impact on the communities. We worked with uh, Project Home on this one, Kira and I, and this was a project where uh, we collaborated with a group of poets. We had a series of workshops at... Uh, uh, the rec center, Hank Gathers, and uh, let me wrap it up. Uh, but anyway, it, it, it was a, a very, um, I'm going to say great project with, with, with lots of moving parts, and I'll talk about this later at some other point, but let me uh, keep it moving. There we go. Performance art piece that came out of that collaboration at the, at, 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 with Porchlight. Uh, this is a piece that was featured at the Jewish Museum uh, last year, I believe, and this was a Again, another collaboration with, uh, with, with Amber and the National Jewish Museum right here in Philadelphia. This was a piece that we did in Tulsa. We took these rubbings of, uh, of, 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 of the surroundings in the Tulsa area, and we'll talk about that later. Again, these are more images from that project. This project was called Dreamland Deferred, mm -hmm. an exhibition that was at sort of the end of that residency. performance that we did there as well. Uh, this is a piece we did with the Asian Art Initiative here in Philadelphia uh, last year called Corner Store. So a little Linda right there. So you, as you'll see, we sort of mixed these different genres uh, and different approaches to, to making public art. Performance, sculptural, uh, is really about being as creative as you possibly can within that public space. And here is the village. Which, a food, which was a food-based project that we did last year. Um, and our video will show us, we'll give more detail about that. How do we uh, get this going? Did it play? All right. Thank you. Yes. Amber Art and Design Collective's residency at The Village has created a space where civic engagement is a form of alternative currency that is as valuable, if not more valuable, than money. We really wanted to tap into people's cultures and tap into their kitchens, and as a way of that, tap into their history. Basically, we go in the community and we offer the opportunity for people to come to the village table to either volunteer or donate a recipe. And when you donate a recipe, that it gets you a ticket to our event. And I believe we've collected maybe almost 150 recipes. We have these recipe cards and we go around and we interview people and we also ask them to think about what kind of memories they have associated with the recipe, a song that they like to listen to when they cook the recipe, and who they like to cook this recipe for. We wanted to give people opportunity to, to share their experience because a lot of people take pride in their cooking. So we wanted people to share that with us as a means of then sharing it with the community at large. Uh, candy yams I usually make up every Sunday with whatever meat I'm cooking. You know, that's my side dish, candy yams. But the recipe came from my mom, her mother, her mother on and on. It's a classic soul food, you know, down south. 
recipe. So right now it's sort of a test period. So just experimenting in the kitchen, trying to sort of work on making these recipes a little bit healthier. So this new recipe calls for orange juice, maple syrup, cinnamon, nutmeg, and the yams. Oh, so you took the sugar out. Yeah, the sugar is now replaced by the orange juice and the maple right, syrup. Right, and the maple syrup. Mm -hmm. Good. You would want to get the wild oil in the hand and put the aromatics in there. And right, you want to sear that off in there. Picking some herbs for this dinner that we have in the night. We just gonna do, do a quick demo on the food that we're making. This is the thyme and the rosemary. Rosemary here, and here's the thyme. Everything has a fresh scent. We want the ambiance and the nostalgia to really resonate in people's minds to where when they enjoy the food and they realize that it's actually locally grown and mostly produce and, and healthy, and all that adds up in their mind as a good experience, they're not gonna be as intimidated to go and experience uh, 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 some vegetables or, or something grown out of a garden next time. So first I wanna welcome you to the village table. Can we get a round of applause? <laughs> You get a four course meal with live entertainment. You get photo shoots and network with people and just get a good atmosphere in the nice community because a lot of people don't know the resources that are available to them. What is one thing that you may have noticed from your all your plates, all the all the servings, all the entrees that you got is that all of them had a lot of color in them? Yeah. Right? So nothing was just one color. There were some greens, there was some orange in the soup. So that's something that you can take with you that's a really simple way of deciding whether what you're eating right now is something that's healthy. It took me out of my element for a minute for a minute and I forgot where I was because it was like so, so peaceful. It was just like, it, it took one event to, you know, actually show you that your Philly is not just about, you know, the violence and, and the argument and the cops and the robbers or whatever you want to call them. But it's more so about, you know, the way that you connect with people and how, you know, different people and di different atmospheres can connect. Which is, you know, why it's so important that artists are doing this and not um, just people who can cook really well, but that we're bringing those people together, is that um, they are designing the experience to feel magical, to feel beautiful, to feel desirable intrinsically. It feels like a family in the community actually getting together, children's families, everybody involved, and it just really feels wholesome. You guys created a great, great block to add to the community because hopefully what you guys are doing here will become contagious and it will spread out around you. I mean, this is a, a great hall you got right here. Great, great. I'm really, really proud of you guys. Even if the neighborhood doesn't say it, they talk about it and they're really, really proud of you guys. They really, really appreciate it. A whole lot. Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah? All right, so that was pretty inspiring. I'm feeling a little bit touched. I'm sure you guys are as well. Um, and I think we got a great sense of the work that's being done here. Um, so I'm going to start off with a kind of general question. Um, if can You guys can hear me, right? OK. So I think a lot about cities, and um, you guys obviously are doing a lot of urban-based work. You both touched on this in your presentation. But I want to go back to it and talk about how place, um, the specific neighborhoods or cities that we're working in, really affects your work. And feel free to give specific anecdotes. I'm a journalist, so I like specificity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely, as as I noted in in our introduction, like 
the reality of space was, was, was one of the key components that, that, that led to us creating ourselves as a group. We came together and via a shared space of production was kind of the, the, the baseline for us becoming a collective uh, working in collaboration. You know, we did via our previous work with, with mural arts and our, our, our ongoing work with mural arts have a very great history of working together as artists. So we had an extreme understanding and trust, not only in each other professionally, but also in terms of our, our uh, abilities. And so trust and the sharing of space was, was the, the, the basis of us being created. But then anywhere we go, we, we look to collaborate with communities that, 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 that we're working with. And as a means of that, you know, we're very, we're, we're, we're very, uh, we want to always keep in mind that we're, we're looking to, to give the narrative of the community life. And with that, through a creative process, really going about uh, whether it's just in, in mural form or, you know, more social practice projects, uh, having art as a, as a means of uh, initiating conversation over potentially touchy subject matters. So anywhere we go, is going to determine and have a, a, a direct influence on the subject matter that we pick and the approach that we take, but also the, the community as a means of engagement have constant influence on the process and the outcome. Great. And Shania or Colin, do either of you want to weigh in? Yeah, I think there's a lot of similarities in how we think about our relationship to the, to the places and communities where we're working. Um, I also think that a lot of our projects are driven by a real curiosity about what place means um, and how that's changing, how that might be changing in a given, at a given time and space. Um, and so beginning with questions. So um, one of the projects that we've done both locally um, and also in a couple of other cities is called Whole City. And in that project, we begin with the question, um, what kind of place are we making together? And that question becomes a jumping off point for conversation across the city with different um, art existing um, artistic organizations and community organizations. And then we turn those conversations into a publication um, and exhibition that, that brings together lots of different perspectives on that question. And then, um, again, it's like a feedback loop using the publication to spark further conversations. And, that sort of thing. Well, you mentioned a feedback loop, and that kind of brings me to my next question. And when you describe your work, you use the term community of practice. And community of practice is a, a term that embodies an important idea about how art artists work in the world um, with each other, collaboration, and with broader groups of stock stakeholders, you know, over a period of time and, and through lots of different situations. So can you describe how that community of practice influences your work? Yeah, um, so thinking about um, how we approach our work as a collaborative pro um, practice, um, we, I think just by nature, the things that we are interested in needed to start reaching out and asking people questions because there were things that we didn't know about. Um, and so one of our, one earlier event um, was during the Occupy movement, we were um, really curious about the ways that our financial um, how we as individuals engage in our everyday finances and how that reflects um, on our larger society. Um, and so we organized an open space meeting um, in a plaza in downtown Minneapolis and invited the, anybody to come and join us um, for this open space where any questions could be asked. Um, but we wanted to kind of um, stock that meeting with people who actually knew things about the history of our financial systems and um, about personal finance and wealth management or how to build wealth in a community when you don't have any. Um, and so having to reach out and um, find expertise all around us um, really started us thinking about that idea of a community of practice um, where we're just one part of that community and for us as artists, um, engaging many other artists, but also many other people, um, our work is better when more of, when we're in conversation with more and more people. And um, they're not just other artists like us, but specifically people um, with other types of expertise. Um, from the scientific, you know, within um, a research institution, all the way down to just um, everyday forms of expertise that are just as valid and um, valuable. Um, and Amber. I'd like to hear from 
you guys sort of about that question and also in in your introduction you talked about how you specifically um, worked with marginalized communities and so maybe how you got to that place and how that works into it yeah um, <clears throat> I think one of the sort of positives of being an artist of color is that we have access in a different capacity as, as, as a non person of color uh, we we also have, a, I think, uh, a different uh, level of responsibility um, with that access. So whenever you know we go into these communities, these are communities that we're, we're from. You know, I, I, I was raised in Los Angeles and grew up in Detroit, and you know, I was familiar with the Heidelberg Project and Tyree Guyton and, and the guys, you know, Edgar Arsenault and the guys in, in, in L.A. And you know, what, what really inspired me about their work was their commitment to the communities. So when I came to Philadelphia and I got involved with Mural Arts, that transition was very natural. You know, uh, we, I took Jane's class at Penn and, you know, after graduate school, Jane offered me a job with Mural Arts. So, so here I am. But, and, and I think that was a sort of similar process for, for all the members of Amber. Uh, we, we've all had the opportunity to, and access into these communities because that, that, that relationship was already established. Mural Arts has been here for 30 years. So when we go into a community, it's already based off of a sort of a, a trust. We have 3,000 plus murals that sort of reflect that. So for us, the pathway was a little bit smoother. And you know, as, as a collective, we, we've done so many projects all over the city of Philadelphia. Um, you know, there's, there's sort of already a, a, a built-in respect and appreciation for what we're doing. And that makes us sort of pushing the boundaries of, of that creative process a little bit easier. Um, I'm not sure if that's your question, but, yeah. but, but you know, so, so it's just in terms of inspiration, uh, we find inspiration from the histories of the city. You know, uh, Every neighborhood has its history, and, and, and a lot of work that we've made references history, references class, references, uh, reference, references uh, power and, and, and the lack of. And so uh, one of the, the big motivators for us as artists um, is to not only give voice to the voices in these communities, but, but make work that's uh, with, with, with sort of a mutual respect for, for, for the art itself. Yeah. I mean, I have to say, just as I've seen a lot of um, sort of pop-up type projects and arts-based interventions in neighborhoods of color and watching, you know, the, the table project, the village table project, there was a kind of um, natural, I don't know, flow to it that I think sometimes I've certainly seen missing in some of those projects. I mean, just to sort of... I, I see your point, um, and maybe I'd be interested to hear from another member of the group, um, sort of about that that responsibility element, and then how sort of as artists of color, do you is it important to collaborate with white artists as well, or to work within their projects at all? Do you feel as if that's useful for you, or I, I don't know? I'm just curious. Well, I think that um, we, the way that we work, we each have our own individual practice as artists, but we have, we realize that there's more power and there's more potential when you collaborate with other people. So I, we collaborate with anyone. It really is more about addressing an issue, you know, mm -hmm. taking a problem in society and framing it as an issue so that you can address these issues working together, working in a collaborative way. So harnessing all the energy uh, within a community, within diverse communities in the city. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, for us, it's really a matter of, of familiarity and, and, and the sincerity that we are able to cross cultural landscapes and demographics. You know, I think artists in general are the ones that are able to kind of finagle their, their way into any, any circle of, of, of a, a city, you know, and they, they have that, that rare ability to, to do so, you know, they, because of their finances, usually they're found uh, living and have studio space in some of the more marginalized communities and are kind of the cultural pioneers of, of uh, what we might call gentrification or at least uh, city growth and expansion. So we're immersed within low-income communities out of necessity. Uh, us being a lot of professional functioning artists of color, that kind of gives us even more access in terms of, uh, I guess, comfort levels 
in, in, in approaching communities uh, that, again, don't have access to art. Uh, you know, they, they, they rotate a number of names, you know, but we'll say communities that don't have access to art. And, you know, it, we, we do carry a torch of responsibility, you know, because we, we do realize that not only do these communities not have a means of expressing themselves creatively, but a lot of times their, their voices are just not heard, you know, and so we would love a lot of times to be that catalyst and, you know, we, we, we do realize that the very sure existence of race and, and all the complexities uh, that, that revolve around it because, you know, we're, we're, we're part of that equation uh, being artists of color, you know, so people uh, have, have a thought in, in, in seeing us right off the bat, but as, as hard as it is to imagine, we, you know, we, we function and try to function uh, without race in, in our creations. Uh, we, we, we love to address the conversation, but in terms of assets and resources, whether it be skills and people coming to the table and just bringing their own abilities, we, you know, we're not racially inclined in any way. It's, it's much more based on a, a skill set you know, and, and the competency. Of course, and how do you see your work influencing others in the field? And you know, feel free to weigh in, Colin, if you want to, or Shanai, and then. Um, I think that one thing we do think a lot about is that idea of a field. Um, and we're actually part of several um, deliberate kind of field building or network building projects that are about trying to create those peer-to-peer -peer connections um, among and between artists who are working in, I guess it goes by many different names, but social practice, mm -hmm. you know, placemaking, community-engaged art, because we all have certain things in common about the ways that we're working and, and the challenges that we have. And, and so I think that we see a responsibility both to be mentors and also to acknowledge where we have been mentored and the things that we've learned and, and the kind of context. So I hope in the field of work that we do that that, that, that we are a resource for others, but that also are con you know, constantly learning and really trying to open up that process to others, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers. I mean, have you seen, and, and maybe you guys want to weigh in here, have you seen the social practice movement growing? Um, in the 10 years that you've been doing this work? Yeah, I mean, I think when we got together initially, we wouldn't identify ourselves as a social practice collective. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's something that's evolved over the years. And, uh, you know, I think as um, others evolve around the world and, and with all these sort of new creative processes, uh, we sort of adapted and made art that responded to it. Right? Mm -hmm. So there was already an external stimulus that we'd make work internally that sort of reacted to that. Uh, in, a, in a sort of reactionary basis, um, but but you know over the last two to three years, you know we've 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 sort of started to sort of formulate a a uh, collective sort of manifesto or sort of identity as, as artists. Um, but it's never been set in stone, and it's always sort of in flux and changing and adapting with with, with the times. Um, and and you know it's also a very uh, sort of approach that sort of allows. Uh, the community, and when we say community, that's really complex, right? You say, of course, like, I mean, it's a very generic term. You know, when we say community, it could be a church community, it could be people on the block, whatever. So it, it all depends how you define community, but we've always tried to make work with, quote unquote, the community in mind. Mm -hmm. and whatever your community is. Right, whichever. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And that kind of brings an interesting point back to this idea of the collective. And I think I'd like to hear from both groups sort of how they define collective. Um, and, and then maybe just a specific anecdote of what it's like to work in a, in a collective. Yeah, I think that we um, have a pretty fluid idea of the word collective and what that means to us. And I think it, for us, it can be different from day to day, depending on what we're doing and who we're doing it with. Um, but um, we kind of touched on it earlier that for us, that idea of collective also involves non-humans. And so it involves our environment and it involves the water that we drink the water that we flush down the toilet. And then that's, some, in Minneapolis at least, it's the very same water that flows through the Mississippi River. Um, and so really trying to think about that idea of how are we in relation to not just each other, but to the city itself and to the world and to all the different systems that um, comprise the city um, is the kind of collective that, that we try to approach our work from. And, and just to give, a, I guess, a specific project-based example, so we have a, 
a project that's ongoing called Water Bar that's been through several different iterations, including a museum <coughs> installation, but also as a um, temporary project that will partner with environmental organizations and, um, and place-based groups to pop up these bars that are serving tap water um, and are basically about um, getting people to think about um, municipal water systems and how they connect to the ecology of a place and then also what our roles are as people who are dependent upon that and also influence that through the actions that we take um, on the land. Um, just as an example, so we work, when we create that project, we work collectively with um, other artists who help us to design and, and fabricate um, the spaces that we pop up, but also with organizations who, who um, provide bartending services. <laughs> so our water bartenders are research scientists or public works employees or people who are involved in water ad advocacy. Um, and they really shape the project through the way that they interact with public participants. Um, and similarly, the participants themselves end up feeding back into the project through responses to, um, we have you know these feedback cards where people can share water stories and those become part of an archive um, that we're building and hope to turn into a publication. So that idea of the collective is pretty pretty fluid. Awesome, I want to go to the water bar. <laughs> Sorry, water bar. Um, all right, you guys want to play in there? Um, I always think of how we function as a collective, like we're a family. We have a huge amount of respect for each other. We've all known each other and worked with each other in various ways over the course of about 10 years or more. And um, that family extends beyond the five artists that we share a space with and collaborate with. You know, it's our friends. I see many of our family here tonight. And, you know, it's also the the other artists and anybody that works with us. Because um, for us, it's really about sharing the skills and resources that everybody comes and brings to the table. So as a group of five artists, we all have different skill sets. And we can help each other to create these amazing projects. I, myself, as an artist, have realized over the years that um, I function best when I'm working with a group of other creative people. So that's, yeah, this is our family of creative people. And we're able to do so much more than just one person. We're really like a collective force. I mean, yeah, just, just to add to that, us, us as a collective and us working collaboratively is really a response to kind of the professional route that we've decided to take. We've, we've all made a very tangible, rational decision to not be one, you know, what might be labeled a studio artist, one that kind of has a lot of alone time and, and looks to sell their work primarily in, in, in a gallery, you know. So us forming and, and, and working in a collaborative fashion is, is very much in line with the work that we do in the public realm, especially in murals. You know, we're, we're, we're constantly interacting and engaging people. We're constantly having conversations that affect the work. And, you know, it's, it's kind of redirected our, our, our path in how we choose to work in, in, in our productive, uh, you know, the, the process that, that we embody. And you know, it, it, it also enables us to do a lot more. We're, we're, we're able to have a fantastic space. There's a, there's a sense of responsibility and safety that we have towards each other. So you know, there is that safety net that is needed in, in the art world today because you know, sometimes rubbing two pennies together is very difficult. You know? and, and so we're also able to you know, really bring our, 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 our most uh, ridiculous ideas in, in, into life, you know what I mean? Because, in, in, in two quick examples of how that could possibly come into play, the village project that you saw was a, a six month residency, and each month we had an event. In order to get any one of those events off the ground, through us as a collaborative force, the people that we worked with in the community, and then just people uh, who came to help and volunteer, we needed over 20 people each night in order to get one of those events off the ground. So it really became a mobile restaurant. You know, if, if that was one or even the five of us, it would be unimaginable. You know? So similar, we're, we're having an event at the Philadelphia Museum of Art on March 25th. It's going to be a procession of healing that is dedicated to the 30th anniversary of the MOVE bombing. 
and we're going to do a procession through many of the galleries of the of of you know a more obscure wing of the museum, entering in, into galleries and, and activating different performers as we enter into the galleries as as a creative response and really again marking that anniversary by us as creative types starting a conversation ideally with with uh, overlapping institutions. Now there's going to be an hour long procession and, and eight or nine different performers involved, you know, but these are all specialists coming to only make whatever we're trying to do that much better, you know, so we're going to have people like a tap dancer, a tap dancer, you know, I, I would probably make a fool of myself if I tried to perform in that way, you know, so it only, it, it, what our process and, and what we've come to embody only strengthens almost any project uh, through collaboration that, that we look to embody. Well, that's a really interesting circle, actually, because you started talking about how you had made the decision to um, to not be studio artists, move out of the gallery into the public sphere. But now it seems like galleries have sort of caught up with you and are saying, hey, actually, we want some of that and inviting you back into the gallery. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that evolution. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I think times are changing. You know, I think the art world is starting to sort of find uh, a comfort zone for, for for social practice and the type of work that we're doing. Um, you know, as Kira had mentioned, you know, uh, we, we sort of find solace in, in the abilities of others. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, I, I think this piece that we're gonna do at the museum, is, it's gonna be um, incredibly powerful in that it's beyond our control as a collective. You know, we sort of have a creative idea of what we want it to be, but when you have these powerful creative forces with other artists come into the space at this one moment to do something that's going to be sort of transformative. Uh, you know, I think that's where the magic happens in terms of the work that we're making. Um, uh, yeah, so, so you know, I, I think as we continue to, to, to evolve as, as, as a creative force, um, I think we're going to continue to sort of push the boundaries of, of what's, what's art and what's not art. Uh, you know, it's, it's ironic that we're doing a piece inside the museum, like you mentioned, but, but you know, I, I think there's a lot of initiative by institutions like the PMA or whatever museum to draw people who wouldn't normally make it into the museum. You know, and, and, and it's such an issue of, sort of class and access, right? Uh, you know, we have one of the great institutions right here in, in, in the city, yet there's people who are five minutes away who've never been there. Um, beyond, you know, as a school field trip is for kids in school or what have you. So there's a lot of effort by these institutions to sort of draw in a different swath of the public fabric. Right? So as artists, you know, we don't have a problem with partnering with the museum to make that happen. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's interesting to think about at this point those institutions are fighting for relevance as much as artists are fighting for impact, and so it's it's a useful collaboration in that way. It, 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 I mean, just another quick note, it also allows us to diversify our, our, our breadth of creativity. There, there's a lot of uh, thematic limitations in a mural. There's also uh, a lot of thematic limitations in what you could do just in the public realm. And for us, having these different platforms to express ourselves, they all come together in one path of, of an overall body of work. But it also allows us to really expand the breadth of creativity and really delve in deep into subject matters where these other platforms might be more limiting. So it gives us more freedom uh, to, to create in these different breaths. And you know, as, as Ernell had, had mentioned, the, the art world evolves constantly, almost by the day or minute. And whatever reality we're in right now, this, this art uh, outside of uh, wall, wall uh, galleries has become very popular in quiche, you know, so it, it would be, it's going to be interesting to see where we go from there, you know, because one of the aspects of art that has always been in function is the commodification of it. So mm -hmm. this work that we're doing and, and other social practice artists is not easy to, to capsulize, not only thematically, but it's hard to bring to a museum and it's hard to sell at that point. There's no real point of resale, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very much aligned with the benefit of the community. Right. Well, and then that brings the interesting question, um, what is the role of, of institutions like Moore and, um, you know, academic institutions and, and nonprofits like, like mural arts 
to kind of, um, what's their role in all this? I see you <laughs> nodding over there. Oh, that's an easy one. Um, no. Um, you know, I don't know. It's something that I think that we're still figuring out. We predominantly work in the public realm or non-traditional arts venues when we are doing something that's like event or time-based. Um, and one of our most recent and <clears throat> really only uh, projects that uh, took, pla took place in a museum uh, was just last year. And for us, it was a real question whether or not we were going to do that, if, it, if, it, if we could find relevance in it and if it was something that we would um, find valuable and it would also have value for the community where that museum's located. Um, and in the end, we ended up doing it. And it's because we were able to find a community partner there that um, was able to say, you know, we do this kind of outreach every day and usually we have to have people come to us. But if we can set up the water bar in the lobby of this museum where 10,000 people are coming through every single day, um, that is going to, like, you know, it's going to exponentially expand the amount of education and outreach that we can do. Um, and so for us, that was, it actually turned into a huge opportunity. And that they were willing to pay college mm -hmm. interns who were coming from community colleges um, in the area who didn't have many opportunities to have meaningful internships that were related to science and environment and, and that we could create those spaces. So, you know, we partner all the time with nonprofits and with cities and public entities and oftentimes, um, you know, our role is, we, we played many different roles, but we're always looking for that opportunity, I think, to be a kind of conduit mm -hmm. between those institutions and the communities in which they are, exist, but maybe aren't, aren't quite making those connections, and can we, can we be, a, be helpful from the middle, you know, um, whether that's creating platforms that have opportunities for real participation on a grassroots level, or whether that's challenging people in positions of power to think differently about how they work. Mm -hmm. um, well, um. Oh, and I was just add that I think that the role of institutions that are interested in facilitating this kind of work is to really understand where they are in those systems of power and within their communities, and how they can really activate resources to um, to provide benefit to the communities that they serve. Um, so we, as just, artists, coming yeah. in to a place like Northwestern Arkansas, have you know, if we're if we're just walking in, we have nothing for them and it's really through um, besides maybe ideas you know but um, it's through the connections that that museum was able to provide that we found a reason to be there um, and that we were able to create something of value um, between us okay well we only have a few minutes left here so i want to ask a, a hard question so we live in a time of increasing inequality and economic disparity um, nationwide these disparities have a racial element uh, the average african-american family has less than a tenth of the wealth of the average white family and in places like philadelphia and the twin cities these issues of, of race and also of class um, are often at the front and center um, so i want both groups to talk about sort of what issues concern you most and then how do you explore these issues in your practice? And I know we've talked a little bit about this, but I'd like to kind of get that out there because I'm sure a lot of people are sort of interested in this. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, race, race is real. <laughs> you know, let's, let's be real because race is real. And, you know, it's, it's something that affects anybody at the moment that they, they, they leave their house, you know, and so, uh, Disparity, you know, Philadelphia continues growth, but it, they're, they're, just as you guys had mentioned, they're, they're, our city is, it has one of the, you know, demographically based in finance, one of the biggest disparities of, of any major city in the country, you know, and the same thing in terms of race can be said for the art world in general. You know, the, last year the NEA did a study where, you know, it proved that 82% of the functioning professional art world was white. You know what I mean? And being an artist of color within that world, you know, it, it, it's, it's a real reality. Imagine, you know, you know, a lot of us are from the African diaspora, you know, that anywhere we go, and the functioning percentage is about three or four percent. You know what I mean? So any, any professional room that we're in, we're only going to see about three or four other people that, that look like us. You know what I mean? And not that that's something that we really dwell in, but it's something that's real. You know, and, and so that a lot of that affects our choices of creativity and, and, and what we choose thematically and the means that we go about producing work. 
and the groups and communities that we work with, not only institutions, but also you know, doing work out in the public. And so that process is constantly, just, even for us, evolving, you know, and something that we're always experimenting and being innovative on, you know, and, and, and trying to really go about it in, 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 in as effective ways as we can. But, you know, it's, a, it's not a subject matter that, that we look to step around. And we, as noted earlier, definitely feel that, that, that art and different means of expression are, are the best means to address that conversation over diverse groups. You know, I think, again, it comes down to familiarity. And, you know, the more that people fam are familiar with each other, the, the, the easier they are able to communicate and work with each other. Mm -hmm. And actually, I want to, but does anyone else from Amber want to chime in there? Uh, no, no, go ahead. Well, I was going to tell just a quick story about race um, relating to our experience in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We were there for a residency, and we were there to research and, and investigate and learn about the race massacre of 1921 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we did a lot of research, um, talked to a lot of people, and what we found there is that a lot of people did not know about this race massacre. It was a very hidden history um, that didn't become common knowledge until around the 70s, I think, when they published an article in a magazine that unveiled this history. But it was also, um, the issue was very black and white, and there wasn't really any talk of anything in between. So we, Kira and I, one night we met with a musician who said to us, you know, you two are really lucky in a way because you have the opportunity to have many doors open, whereas there's going to be doors that are open to him because of what he looks like, and there's going to be doors that are open to me because of what I look like. And when, when we work together, we're able to open and unlock a lot of different doors and walk in and out of different social circles, maybe class or race, but, you know, we're able to have these conversations and discussions often, but, you know, in a way that kind of involves everybody. Yeah, that's really, I think that's really special. Um, I, I, I'm interested, you know, it seems like your point earlier, Shania, that, that you don't see yourself as place-based. I feel like that comment has something to do with this conversation that we're having around disparities in cities somewhat? Am I overreaching here? You can tell me if I am. I'm sure it's related. Yeah, I mean, I, um, <laughs> we'd have to talk that out a little bit, but yeah, I mean. Uh, so, yeah, well, I'm interested in finding out sort of, you know, your thoughts on that, but also maybe you could talk a little bit about how you talked about how art is sometimes um, used, you know, sort of instrumentalized and in, artists. in artists in various class differences, yeah. and, I'd, and I'd like, you to address that a little bit and your role in that. Yeah, I just want to echo what both of you have said that, you know, this is a real thing. You know, race and racism, white supremacy, these are real issues and we can't talk around them. Um, and I think similarly for us, it's something that we don't want to shy away from and also um, acknowledge that the questions that we need to ask ourselves are different um, when we're thinking about the ways that we work with different communities that are not necessarily the communities to which we identify. You know, I, I'm not even from Minneapolis. I grew up in a town of 100, uh, very working class, very working poor community and rural community. Um, and so I'm coming to even working in a city from a kind of odd place. Um, but just thinking about the kinds of questions that, that we feel like are important to be asking from, from where we're at um, have to do along those lines of who's benefiting. Um, there's a real danger in the work that we do, uh, that question of being instrumentalized. So we're working with partners who um, represent city government or who represent um, community and economic development. And sometimes the goals that they have around those things, how a community or a city should be developed, are very different than our goals. Um, does that mean we shouldn't work together? Um, we don't think so. Um, we think that means we have to work together. 
Um, and so because we are often invited to tables that other artists may not be just because of the privileges we've had, because of um, where we are and what we look like, what is our responsibility then to continue to open doors and also to say what can, how can we pass some of these, this access along? How can we open these doors for others, ch have challenging conversations wh where we can with our peers and with other people? Um, and it's complicated. And you know we don't have an answer, but we don't always succeed in holding open that space as well as we should. Um, but it's something that we're definitely thinking a lot about. And um, Twin Cities is a strange place. There's been a lot of money um, brought into our community in the last couple of years around placemaking specifically. Um, philanthrop philanthropic foundations very interested in a specific type of work. Um, and so I think that that's another reason why these questions seem very relevant and urgent is that we recognize that we are a city with these huge disparities and that there is also this opportunity in the form of support for artists to do this work. And so how can we be strategic and smart about it um, is something that we think about. Yeah, and as, <clears throat> as cities and others are more and more interested and more and more money is coming into supporting artists who do work in community in different ways, um, there's, an, there's a tendency to kind of simplify and, and sometimes um, that ends up looking like uh, we are looking to artists to solve problems. Um, and I think that that can be really dangerous. And I wouldn't, um, while I think that the more support that there is for artists to do this kind of work, the better, um, I want to always make sure that, they're, that we're cre creating space and allowing artists to create problems or to um, call bullshit on something when it's not the way that it should be. Um, and so just, when, um, you know, when specifically when a city is, you know, a city community engagement department is w contracting with artists to do community engagement, um, I think that it's just kind of coming back to that idea of responsibility. Um, the artists need to just be very aware of um, the motivations of everybody involved. Arnold looks like he wants to say something. No, you know, I, I, just, I think it's a great conversation. I, and, you know, I'd always sort of, sort of put out there that, if, that we all have to be very mindful in terms of of uh, responsibility, um, but also the opportunity of, of exploitation within these communities that are marginalized, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. there's so many challenges and so many things that need to be addressed. And you know, when you're making work within that context, it's, it's, it's easy to go in any community uh, as artists, do something that you personally benefit from, right? Mm -hmm. And then keep it moving. And so you know, I, I think sort of maintaining you know, these sort of longer relationships and sort of established partnerships with other social services or people within that community is vital. Process. Yeah, uh, everyone made great points there. And I think I just want to end with one last question before we turn it over to the audience. Um, to hear just from each of you, sort of, or each group, just what is like your most successful or like most favorite project that you've worked on? <laughs> most favorite? Uh, yeah, there's so many. Yeah, yeah there's no most. Um, I th for me, it. it it's very hard to answer questions like that. You know, it, it'd be, you know, it'd be like asking me who my favorite person or musician or color is. You know, and so, I, I think I think there's very strong components of appreciation to, uh, you know, a lot of different projects and things that you walk away, you know, with a different different varying levels of learning that that, that uh, had happened. You know, and for me, I, I'll say. I appreciate doing projects where I'm, I'm challenged the most, where uh, the result is a success uh, through those challenges and, 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 and potential points of conflict because of how challenging either the theme or the process was. And you know, I think all of us within our group challenge each other to be as innovative as we can, uh, not only in the mediums that we select and choose, but also the execution of it and the layering that we, we take. You know, so for me to vaguely and, and, and uh, you know, more loosely answer your question, it's, it's the projects that challenge me the most uh, through our process and every, every part involved that ideally end successfully and, and challenge others uh, along the way as well. I, I have one in particular. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been holding, I've been sitting on this one, the book here's shaking, but, but I think Porchlight with, uh, with Muriel Arces was definitely uh, my favorite project. Um, and it, it was because it was, it was a collaboration with so many different 
entities. And, and, and it also sort of gave Kier and I uh, uh, a language, our artistic language, to collaborate with. You know, we had poets, we worked with uh, mothers and, and, and children who s suffered from homelessness or had issues with drug addictions and, and so forth. So it was, it was a very layered uh, and complicated project. And, and it also sort of spawned a whole new creative approach for us as a collective. You know, we, we got into performance art, we got into some sculptural stuff. We, we started using mixed media uh, in our mural, which was, was, which was something brand new. And, 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 you know, and that process was uh, us going around the community in North Philly and collecting trash. <laughs> And, and, and with people in the neighborhood and, and, and sort of transforming and upcycling that found material in art. And suits. Yeah, while, you know, while doing a performance. So it was, it was really uh, sort of groundbreaking for us as, as, as a team, but also in, in terms of, of, of pushing the envelope a little bit with, with, with public art in Philadelphia. I mean, everyone sort of had a, a have a, a sort of a, an idea of what they perceive public art mm. ought to be, and uh, we sort of played with it a little bit. Yeah, wow. mm, I do have a favorite too. My favorite was the village table, and um, I feel that way because we really experimented a lot. It was extremely experimental for us. In a lot of ways, we didn't really know what was going to happen. We had an idea of what we wanted to happen, but we weren't the teachers. We were the students in a way. You know, we learned so much from the community and from the other people that we worked with. And I see Miss Eva here, and I saw Martine come in, and I don't know who else is here from that project, but thank you guys for coming. Um, I, my, my favorite projects that we've been able to work on are those kinds of listening projects where we are um, creating these situations where we're able to um, hear from other people about their experiences and, and look for um, those kinds of things that we share. And, I think one, one project in particular that continues to be successful at doing that, I think, is a project that we do called Give and Take, which was actually developed with a number of other collaborators early on, probably predates Works Progress, actually, formally, but began as a kind of monthly community show and tell that was based around the questions, what do you know and what do you want to know? So really trying to create a space where um, whatever that knowledge that you're bringing with you to that space is, is valid and interesting and, and then to really draw that out. Um, and you know everybody who would come to the event wore a name tag that they would write that in um, and there would be community presentations and we would work with people to design um, presentations that were really interactive. So to bring to life the things that they know, everything from how to bake really great pie a woman who is starting up her own pie business um, out of a community kitchen to um, aquaponics to brain surgery like just the kind of and um, and and to me that really exemplifies um, that kind of project and over time it has evolved into um, a kit so now we have a kit that um, anyone can get to create their own event that has all the tools in it and the things that we've learned um, through the program and um, we encourage other people to take it and, and run with it and evolve it and um, and now cities are starting to do that so there's a, a suburb north of Minneapolis that has just now starting to develop neighborhoods. They've never had actual neighborhoods that have named and defined and so they're working with their community to, 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 to create these kind of naturally occurring neighborhoods and they're using give and take as a regular um, meeting space for people to come together and talk about um, what is important to them about the place that they live. So, I don't know if you'd add to that or... <laughs> uh, I love give and take too. It's a fun project. I really like that it's evolved and um, a lot of, like, it started out as something that we were doing on a monthly basis. And now, like Shanae said, um, we're really figuring out how to turn it into a tool that anybody can use. And so just being able to see, you know, and this, this is since 2009, so, um, I just love when these projects have these long lifespans that evolve and change over time. Wow, well, this has all given us a lot to think about, uh, especially I'm just wondering, if I worked with my husband, I am positive he would not agree with what I was saying about the project we were doing. We had an so airplane ride to kind of get on the same page, so <laughs> that's why so we're not up here arguing about it. for everything on all fronts. Um, and now we're going to open up to the audience for some Q&A. <laughs> Hello, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Antonio, and thank you guys for being here today. I just found about this event this morning, and I'm very glad that I came. Uh, I want to ask you guys a very specific question. Um, I have $20,000, 
and I'm applying for 20,000 more for a place-making project in a specific place that I have. I could describe it to you, whatever. But what's your advice on what I should do? <laughs> That's, <a big> question. <laughs> That's why I came here today. <laughs> wow. Give it to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, um, Join these guys. Yeah. And I, I really think it depends on what it is you're trying to accomplish. You know, if it's if it's a project that's going to be about engaging the community, I think building consensus and bringing in other voices to that conversation of whatever it is that you you, you hope to do. Um, I, I'm not quite sure how to answer your question because I I think I need more information. Um, <laughs> but I don't know, maybe someone else here can. I mean, yeah, I mean. I, uh, it's a little vague what, what, what you're asking, <laughs> you know, hey, I, you know, but, um, you know, you really want to think, you, you really want to give it a, a, a really thorough thought process in terms of you as a creative person bringing what is possibly considered your gift uh, to a community as a point of collaboration, you know, and you really want to go there and do research. You really want to get somebody within the community who's entrenched that you can get information from and also use as a point of reference and somebody who's going to give you sound information and judgment. And you know, if you're not experienced yourself in these kind of projects, you want somebody who is. You know what I mean? Because there's a lot of potential mistakes that could be made by going into a community and just thinking that you're there to potentially help people or, you know, it, you know, there's a long history of conflict and bad perceptions between uh, communities of color and not nonprofits that are usually run by people that don't look like the community that they're working with of going in and, and trying to fix and save people, you know, so. You just really want to think out your process, not knowing exactly what you are planning to do. You really want to, you know, you really want to do your, your due diligence. I agree. I think that's great. I just, I'll make a quick pitch for Next City. Get lots of ideas on nextcity.org about community-based projects. Here, 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 here. Oh, boy. Hi, um, I have a quick question just about the different types of projects you all have done. Um, could you talk a little bit about the difference and impact of maybe some of these um, more temporary events that um, you know really engage a community in an event and to have them connect with one another and maybe even have the community look forward to this event the next time um, versus maybe the long-standing nature of something like a mural that becomes a meeting place and an artistic narrative for the area. Can you talk about those different types of impacts? And um, I don't know if that informs your future projects at all. I mean, it's an ongoing process for us, I think. And they're, they're all sort of interrelated, where although it might be more on a temporary basis, it still sort of connects to something we've done in the past. So the work that we sort of create collectively uh, it's continuous, you know, and so, you know, in, in relationship to the more established uh, projects, um, you know, I'm not quite sure how they relate. I, I think they, they're supportive in a lot of ways because some of the ideas are shared. Um, but for us, I think what's really important is really the relationships that we build with the community. Um, like tonight, we had some folks who are part of Village Table here tonight, and it's us. We find uh, uh, inspiration through those relationships and those connections with those communities. And I think that inspires us to make more work. You know, and, and hence the saying, diversity is the spice of life. I think part of our, our livelihood is, it functions around how many different things that we can do, just, just how a functionality uh, and, and standpoint and, and the type of opportunities that are available to us. You know, we all are teachers, we can give lectures and workshops, we do murals, but we also sculpt, we perform, you know, so it's like that lack of limitation for us has enabled us an extreme sense of flexibility. And there is a, a, a baseline or an intertwined kind of thematic pulse that has 
entrenched itself with most of the work that we do. We, we still will take on, you know, out of necessity, commercial projects, you know, and that's a separate entity, but like, ultimately, even though it's such a, a variety of, of different creative themes, we're, we're, we're still going in the same direction, and, and the work informs uh, each other, and a lot of it is rooted in advocacy, and, and uh, yeah, really, really uh, creating narratives uh, for communities in, in, in a creative realm. <coughs> Yeah, I think um, we would echo that. And, you know, we are, the projects that we do take a lot of different forms. And um, I think that we, we do also end up going and working with some of the same organizational and community partners over and over again. So, you know, we have sever several projects that were kind of temporary experimental projects, but all of them were in collaboration with one neighborhood organization in particular that was partic that was really interested in experimenting with their own community engagement, and so we could be kind of a R&D lab. Um, and so even though something's very temporary, it's part of a longer arc of, of kind of learning and, and relationship building, and thematically, a lot of our projects work the same. So you know, we might take an idea and try it in one context and, and learn from it and um, and then redo it again somewhere else and try again and, and keep working through things that way. And also thinking about even if it's just a one night event that you're putting together, how do you tell the story of that in a really compelling way that can spread um, that idea even further? And so I think the video that um, Amber Arts put together about the Village Project um, just did a really beautiful job of um, telling that story um, and in all of its richness. Um, and so we've been thinking about um, our publications doing that and also ourselves doing more documentary video, um, both about arts and creativity in our community and um, now starting to kind of look at um, specific projects of ours and how do we put this into a video format. And how can those, those documentary projects also be a process of making a public? How can you work together with the folks who you're working with on a project to actually document and tell that story? I think it's important. Hi, how are you guys? Um, thank you again for the words of wisdom. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm uh, here representing, uh, in part representing an organization called Emerging Arts Leaders Philadelphia. And uh, our whole year theme is what's next in arts. And so we picked this event as our first field trip. So you're what's next, so thank you. And if anyone's here Hopefully from that group. The PMA will be your second, <laughs> March not, 25th. I'm not sure they're what's next necessarily, but I don't know. If you're here from this group, if you want to meet down the hall afterwards, we can talk. But um, my question, uh, Colin, right? Yes? Yeah. OK. Uh, and it's really framing the panelists, but you brought it up. Um, you said something that really struck me. You said uh, we need to give space for artists not just to solve problems, but to create problems, something like that. And I was that just like light bulb was like, oh, man, that's a whole new way, potentially of seeing things and something I feel personally very frustrated our country uh, as an artist in this country I feel like I'm just trying to solve all the time and I feel that there are some really more inspirational on the ground artists who are creating problems in some countries in which you know they're really making movements so I uh, question for everybody but I was wondering if you could kind of comment upon what that really means to you and how that's translated in your work yeah, I mean, I think it sometimes it just for us means that when an individual artist puts his or her neck on the line and says something and speaks up, um, being able to support that person and show solidarity and have their back in whatever ways that you're possible. Um, and so in our community, um, you know, really uh, ever since um, Trayvon Martin's death, I feel like um, the, and, and surely before this, but I feel like really in the last year, um, the inequity that's um, just pervasive in the Twin Cities has been um, on everybody's mind. And um, anywhere artists get together, it's something that we're all talking about. Um, and so for us, it's been uh, just a real um, education. And like it, sometimes our role is just to sit down and listen. And that's all that. Shania and I need to do when you know when we're in some of those circles. Um, but then there, but then there are specific artists and artists of color who get asked to come to tables again and again, but maybe aren't really valued for being there. You know, it's sort of like they're not they're not paid for their time, but they're acting as consultants. And when one of those artists stands up and says, "Hey, I'm going to make a problem here where you didn't think there was a problem," we feel like it's our responsibility to really stand 
with that person and not just do the Minnesota nice thing, which is to be like, ooh, conflict. I'm afraid of conflict. But really to say, you're right. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's one way we mean by making problems, you know, um, something that might not appear to be a problem to certain people, but really is a problem. And it might not always be an art project in and of itself. It might just be, you know, raising your voice. Um, and so, and that also just brings up the one reason why I don't think it's fair to ask problem, uh, artists to, to be problem solvers is that these are issues that are so much bigger, you know, than the arts. And um, it seems like there's a tendency right now to try to like find, like desperately search for like how, how can we quantify the value of the arts? And if it's not arts for art's sake, well then it's got to be something else and we need to figure out, you know, and it's the tendency is to kind of figure it figure out its monetary value, you know? And so I think that while it's much more than this, I think that there's a lot of creative placemaking projects that are really just looking at the ways that artists um, can develop a community in a way that's beneficial for the city. And, um, and that's, I mean, we're speaking from our specific context, yeah. right, of the Twin Cities. And also not saying that artists who want to solve problems and are solving problems shouldn't be doing that. Right. Just, just trying to expand the field a bit, I guess. Hi, I'm Betty Jean. I'm also with the Emerging Arts Group, a retired teacher, and I'm a firm believer that the arts and design can be a framework for teaching and learning. And I was wondering if you were able to make any kind of an impact uh, on education, especially in the school system, because in this you know era of testing, arts are kind of thrown away, and I just you know feel so bad that some teachers are afraid to you know, embark upon the arts as a purpose in their classroom? Well, we, um, as Amber, we all have a background in education, and we've all worked with, with various schools across the city. Um, so, yeah, education is extremely important to us, and there's a huge problem in Philadelphia. A lot of schools don't have visual art. They don't have music. They don't have dance and theater programs. So it becomes incumbent on artists to come into the schools, to find a way to come into the schools and to work with English teachers and math teachers and find a way to integrate art into the curriculum because it helps students become better learners when they're able to cre uh, create poetry and recite a poem or sing a song. You know, it, it helps students to also learn language. We have a lot of students, um, a lot of young people in Philadelphia who don't speak English as their first language, so art plays a role there as well. I, yeah, I, we are all huge advocates for art in collaboration with, with uh, educational curriculums in, 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 in any full capacity form that, that, that is possible. And, you know, I think it's been proven time and time again that the raising influence of art within a, a overall art, uh, educational curriculum has the, the grandest effects on the, the positive outcomes of, of all the other subjects. And, you know, it's just mind-boggling and stifling to me how repeatedly that the creative influences and whether it be music and, or theater or what have you, and then uh, on, the, on the flip side, means of, of physical expression and, and, and physical release a la gym class and recess continually to get cut, you know, and then here we are in Philadelphia questioning ourselves why our education system is so shot, you know, so with that in mind, us as a group, we are only able to function within the resources that come our way, you know, and we're not invited to that more systemic conversation and table, you know, we're not invited to that conversation, you know, given, and, but we, we, we constantly implement ourselves within the classroom environment, especially in the public schools and also the community environment. But we're only able to work with what resources we have and uh, we're not able to invest in, in a, a, a long-term basis in any one situation because of our lack of resources uh, and funding available to really give uh, a definite answer uh, uh, that, that we've seen differences in, say, test scores. You know, what I can say is that I've mentored, <coughs> um, I've mentored and taught 
many a young person in, in this city and others, and I've seen the per personal growth and the personal sparks that happen when somebody realizes that a renewed voice of expression uh, has been lit, the flame has been lit again, and you know, the, that breath of creativity has, has been breathed b back into the individual. I've seen that more personal reaction, but unfortunately, long answer short, we haven't been able to be, be invited to that, that, that larger conversation of, of art as an overlapping influence within the school system. Yeah, and our experience mirrors that more or less. Um, but I would add that both Shania and I went to different uh, arts-based high schools. Um, I am Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Shania in Minneapolis. Um, and so I think we have both seen firsthand just how, um, how that framework is um, so valuable to the, um, a young person's education. Um, but again, um, haven't put ourselves into that and context. And there are some really great organizations and projects in the Twin Cities that, you know, were really great examples of, of something looking at education and working with young people. And just one that, you know, I would mention that you could look up if you're interested, but Juxtaposition Arts in North Minneapolis has really gone from an education, art education and art, artistic expression resource into really a, a kind of design center in a lot of ways that doing work that is both educational but also has a community development and impact entrepreneurial and entrepreneurial impact. kind of lens but really focused in a neighborhood where they've been working um, for years now um, and their work is just fantastic. I'm going to get on the other side of the question now and just chime in for a second and say that I think in this the answer to this is sort of uh, underscores the need for sort of collective action because it's, it's kind of a cruel irony that at the same moment when cities municipalities are recognizing that arts actually play a really critical role in community revitalization and economic development um, schools are also sort of cutting away the sort of the the classes and programming need needed to train the next generation of artists. And so it's really an opportunity, I think, for people in the arts community and the education community and everyone else really to get a, get together and really say, no, we, we need to be teaching art in schools. This is important not only for young people, but also for the future of our cities. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Melinda, and I'm a graduate student here at Moore. And I want to thank you for coming out and for sharing so much of your experience with us tonight. It means a lot. Um, my question to you has to do with a couple words that came up in our conversation. Mainly I've heard words like blue collar and marginalized communities and we're hearing about you know, what a collective is and how to, how to influence people and how to be flexible with the communities that you're working with. So I mean as an artist and as an, a human being I'm wondering how, how when you go into a community if you run up against you know, conflict and, you know, people in groups who have a, a very different perspective on what they want in their community, how do you, how do you, I guess, like open the floor for a conversation that the community can be involved with and have it not be, you know, like an institutionalized commercial conversation, if that makes sense? That's a really good question. <laughs> Um, I think one, one way that we have found, I guess, for us to answer that question is that we never do projects in places that we aren't invited by someone, by an organization, by a community group. Um, and even when we are, we know that they don't necessarily represent the community. And so that, that, that time in a project where you're building relationship and trust is so, so important. And we really insist on front-loading projects with a lot of time. So we're, right now, we are in the midst of uh, probably our biggest public art commission for the city of St. Paul, which is public art for a library and community center. Um, and we have been working for about a year, and nothing has been made. What we've been doing instead is spending that time 
um, while jumping through bureaucratic hoops. But beyond that, um, meeting with uh, different or different groups, everything from a group of elders who meet at a coffee shop, and, and that's really their community center, and spending time with them there, um, to going to existing organizations and grassroots efforts and finding out what's happening, where can we be useful, and where can we amplify what is already going on with the project, rather than trying to think that we're going to come in um, with a totally new idea <coughs> that's going to change change the place. Um, so really that, that time and trust and also acknowledging that that is not a simple process and it's hard um, and you have to be um, willing to engage in that and also know that sometimes projects are going to fail. You know, we had a, a one project where um, because of a, a, a change in leadership at an organization, we went from having real buy-in and commitment on a project to having no one and really having a lot of skepticism about what we were trying to do. Um, and had, had we known better, we wouldn't have gone forward. <laughs> we would have walked away from that project, but we went forward with, without that, and um, it, it didn't work. It never, it, but yeah. it's, it's when you're front-loading your <laughs> engagement like that um, and, and not jumping right into the work, in that situation, it was, um, it was hard and it was painful, and we spent probably about six months trying to find, um, getting, trying to get everyone onto the same page. And after that amount of time, we, it was clear that it wasn't gonna happen. Um, and so that sucked really bad. Um, but at least we hadn't already started spending, you know, the grant monies. Um, and that organization that had that grant was able to figure out what to do with that money. Um, and it was just the right choice for us to, to allow them to do that and to walk away from the project. Yeah, I think it's very important not to generalize. You know, I think, I think you need to realize that, that communities are very much in line with, like, say, the personality traits of, of varying human beings and that you, you're not going to approach any one community with, with one, some overlapping template that you're going to be able to insert and apply and press play. You know, and, mm -hmm. and um, to replicate the, the thought that, that Shania said, I think the most important thing is to, to go and, and, and first listen. You know, I, think, I think the most important thing that you could possibly do in any of these situations where you're looking to engage people is, is to go and listen and just talk to people. You know, the, the Porchlight Project that, that Arnell had mentioned of, we could have went to that community, which is roughly around 24th and Ridge Avenue, a community that has um, you know, its share of issues, we could have went to that community, and, and, and I, I lived not that far from there for about a 10-year stretch, so I had a good idea of what the community embodied, but we still, with all that in mind, could have went to that community and had preconceived notions of what we wanted to do, you know, but instead we went and we talked at length repeatedly uh, with the consensus of the community, not just one person, but many people, and ask them what were issues that they wanted to address, you know, and how we could function as a beacon for them and bring life to issues that they feel are plaguing. And, you know, we probably would have focused more on things of crime, but to our pleasant surprise, uh, you know, they, they, they picked um, pollution and trash and things of that nature as, as one of the most distracting and, and uh, non-positive aspects of, of their daily existence. So all of a sudden, you know, what could have been something that we would have went a whole nother direction, all of a sudden, and we're very happy to work with that subject, but they let us know what was on the top of the list of, of things that, that were troubling them. And just to echo what Kier and Shanai said, um, one of the things Shanai said was about failure. And I'm a firm believer that failure is actually a really good thing for artists to experience because it's how we learn and how we grow. So it sucks. You want all of your projects to go really well, but you take a risk. And sometimes your projects will fail, but ultimately you're gonna learn something from it and you'll be able to go on and do better work as a result. Okay, and on that note, we unfortunately have to wrap up the event, but I do wanna encourage you, this person over here, someone over there, had questions, so maybe 
people can group around them or the panelists can engage them directly. Um, but as we wrap up, I just want to give a thanks to Ariella Cohen for moderating and and to the panelists again, thank you. So if you know somebody that you think would be interested in this, uh, we were streaming the event and that'll be uploaded to Moore's YouTube page in uh, the very near future. Um, and please keep in touch with us. Uh, come on out to our next events and keep in touch with these artists. Thanks a lot, y'all.